and a leading scientist and who has built an of healthcare and research spanning cities to urban areas entirely on the back of his own efforts and that of his team, of course. He trained in uh, initial MBBS years and SEO MD medicine as well, I think from Madras Medical College. But after that, he was not only a welcome fellow, he was also a Humboldt fellow, um, which are both would be cutting edge research applications. And you came back to start diabetes treatment research set up your foundation, a benefit, I think I was going to say lakhs, but millions might be a more appropriate word for what you do, and let some of the most important cohorts in India, of which I'm glad to be one small part. With that, Dr. Mohan, to you. And also a great author, by the way, you must read his book. Thank you, Anurag, for that uh, very kind and generous introduction. I'd like to thank Rahul and the whole team for inviting me to this meeting, I was wondering how I would fit into, a, as a clinician, fit into a meeting like this, but then the few hours that I've spent here, I've already learned so, many, so much from the earlier speakers. My talk will not be theoretical, definitely. Um, <clears throat> I'll hope to share with you a little work that we have done to show you how complex one disease can be. When you think of diabetes, often people ask me, how do you spend your whole life, 50 years, you worked on this one disease, don't you get bored? The more, at the end of 50 years, five decades, I feel I know less about diabetes than when I started. Life was much simpler when we started. It gets so complex now that I feel I know very little about uh, diabetes. So on that note, that's why the topic is called heterogeneity of type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes is only one of several types of uh, diabetes that we see. I have no conflict of interest in this particular slide. So before I talk to you about type 2 diabetes, which is the commonest form of diabetes that we see, not only in India, but all over the world, you want a idea about uh, how common it is or what, what the percentage of people with type 2 diabetes, about 90% or more of all forms. If you take 100 people with diabetes, more than 90 of them would have type 2 diabetes. But the other 10% is made up of some 40 to 50 different types of diabetes. Some of them are so complex that even for me, it's a challenge. After 50 years working in this field, when somebody walks in with a rare form of diabetes, it'll take me months sometimes to actually pin down the diagnosis. You need so many tests before you actually pin it down. But why should you do this? Because the clinical course is different. The prognosis is different. There are, for example, you take another common type of diabetes, which is type 1, and we'll be talking about that a little later uh, towards the end of my talk. Type 1 diabetes, you all know, it affects children below the age of 15 or at any age, in fact, it can come. Now, if you have a child with type 1 diabetes, if you stop insulin, insulin is the only treatment for type 1 diabetes. And if you stop that insulin, the child will die, period. So 100 years ago, before insulin was discovered, the lifespan of a child with type 1 diabetes was two months. One year was kind of exceptional. Today, I have people with type 1 diabetes who have finished 75 years. And one of them is now 90 years old. Got it in his 15, he's now 90. 75 years, he's been taking insulin, he's doing well. Now, if at any time in that life he had stopped insulin, he would have died immediately. Okay, so that's type 1 diabetes. Now, suppose you have a child and you're not sure that's type 1 or type 2 and you end up treating it as type 2 and it turns out to be type 1, you could be sued for murder because you knew that the child could have had type 1 diabetes. You stopped insulin and the child died. It's as, it's as serious as that. So it's not an academic exercise that you're somehow trying to put a label on some type of diabetes. It makes a lot of difference. Now, there are children who come to me with type 1 diabetes, and this is just a prelude before we get into type 2 diabetes, about which I'm going to talk more. But if you have a child who walks in, and I feel, examine the child, and I find the child has a big liver, and the liver function is abnormal, I'm worried, because the child may not have type 1 diabetes. The child can have a genetic syndrome, for example, a syndrome called walcott rollison syndrome. If the child has walcott rollison syndrome, the child will not celebrate the 20th birthday. There's, there's no child in the world who has gone on beyond 20 years of age with Walcott-Rollison syndrome. They will die. 
of either kidney disease or renal disease or both. Now, when a child walks in, if I'm not going to make that diagnosis and I'm going to tell them, oh, you're also going to live up to 90 years of age, I'm doing a great disservice. So you can see how complex it is when you're treating human beings with what we think is just one diagnosis, but it's actually not. If you leave all those aside, and I'll come back to that in the end, because we do some work on monogenic diabetes, and I'll come back to that, which needs genetic testing, and I'll come back to that. Let's just talk about type 2 diabetes. Now, type 2 diabetes is a common form, and everybody thinks, oh, it's so simple, you know, so is type 2 diabetes the same? It's not, because just look at five variables, and these would be of interest to you if you're putting in some models to find out different types of diabetes. It's things like this that we look at. Look at the body mass index. It can be very different. You can have a very thin person with type 2 diabetes and you can have an extremely obese person with type 2 diabetes. And they are completely different metabolically. And I'll show you that. Age at onset. Again, I'll show you. You can get diabetes which sets in after 70, 80, 90 years of life. In fact, my grandmother, who was a doctor also, when she, she used to keep on saying, I don't have diabetes, I'm so, because she was a doctor and she kept saying, oh, I don't have diabetes. Look at my son, that's my father, uh, who was a famous diabetes player. Look at him, he has diabetes. I don't have diabetes. And at 85, she got diabetes. It was very severe. She needed insulin and ultimately died of diabetes. Okay. So you can never say that if you have got, not got diabetes by 60, that you'll never get it. You can get it at any age. You can get newborn children with diabetes. Of course, in the first six months, it's unlikely to be type 1 diabetes, likely to be monogenic diabetes. But after six months, and sometimes even before six months of age, you can get type 1 diabetes. So that's the age at onset. Response to medication. You give somebody metformin, and they respond beautifully. You can increase the dose, one gram, two grams, nothing happens to them. Somebody else, you give metformin 250 milligrams, 500 milligrams, they're purging away, they have diarrhea, they simply can't take it and they don't respond. So that's another challenge. How do we know which patient will respond to which medication? Are there algorithms by which we can do that? As clinicians, we are not able to find out who will respond to which treatment. Susceptibility to complications. I have patients who are diagnosed age of 12, 14, and by 18, they've gone blind due to diabetic retinopathy. You may say, well, they could have got it earlier. They couldn't have got it longer than 18 years, because they're only 18 years old. And there are others who have not had such great control. 60 years later, they have no complications of type 2 diabetes. You look at their A1C, not all that great, but they're not getting complications. How can you predict who will get and who will not get? That is where I think this whole paradigm comes in of finding AI to help us with that. Now, let's take body mass index. You can get somebody who is extremely thin with a body mass index less than 18.5, you would think that type 2 diabetes associates with obesity. Well, it is usually, but you can get lean, thin, malnourished type 2s as well. And we have publishers long ago, I'll show you that. You can have normal weight people, you can have overweight people, you can have grossly obese people. I have BMI of 45, people who need bariatric surgery walking in with type 2 diabetes. Both have type 2 diabetes, okay? That's a paper, for example, 1997, we published on lean NIDDM, people who had BMI less than 18.5, and they had type 2 diabetes, which is then called as NIDDM. Age at onset, these are four patients whom we reported less than 10 years of age, and they had type 2 diabetes, not type 1 diabetes. How do we know? We've done all the tests. All the antibodies were negative. The C-peptides were good. They responded to tablets. They had obesity. They had family history of diabetes. Both their parents had diabetes, and the children continued to respond to tablets. What's their age? Seven, eight, nine. You would never think that type 2 diabetes which comes in adults can come at seven years of age. But that is just an initial report. We have more cases now. It can be the other end of the spectrum. Here are patients who are above 90 years of age, and they have type 2 diabetes. Some of them have got it only when they're 80, 85 years old. Some have got it earlier, but now they have crossed 90 years of age. Here is a group of people. There are two. I hope you can identify the two people in the middle who are less than 90 years old. One is me and the other is my daughter. All, everyone else in that room 
is above 90 years of age. Some of them are above 100 years of age. The reason I'm showing you this is because we always keep saying that diabetes shaves off at least five or 10 years of your age. And therefore, the life expectancy of somebody with diabetes should be less than people without diabetes. The life expectancy in India today is 69 years for males and 70 years for females. And this is not for people with diabetes, the general life expectancy in India. Okay. With that background, if you can have hundreds of people with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, who live for 50, 60 years, and now have crossed 100 years of age, and they don't have any complications, what is that we are missing? What is that is special about these people? Worth studying, isn't it? To find out whether they have a special longevity gene or something else. It's not definitely control of diabetes. Not all of them had A1Cs, which are completely normal and so on. No, not at all. They were just average people, but yet they managed to live so long. Response medication susceptibility we've already talked about. Now let's talk about type 2 diabetes. Now, with all that heterogeneity which I talked about, that they could be thin, they could be old, they could be young, they could be male, they could be female, they could be so many changes within type 2 diabetes, we'll have to put it into some kind of a perspective. We know that everyone with type 2 diabetes is not the same, but how do you classify them? There was a very interesting paper published in 2018, and this is a start of a lot of work on clustering of type 2 diabetes. So what this group in Sweden said, uh, driven by Leaf Group, they looked at some clinical parameters, did deep learning, K clustering method was used. And using that, I think the parameters are shown here, they use GAD antibody testing, because GAD antibody kind of rules out type 1 and shows you if it's negative, then it's type 2. They used age, BMI, HbA1c, HOMA beta is uh, from the fasting insulin. You can get an index of how much your insulin secretes, how much your pancreas is uh, secreting insulin. And insulin resistance, again, from the fasting insulin, the fasting glucose, you can say how resistant you are. So looking at one measure of resistance and one measure of insulin secretion, what they and using three um, cohorts in Scandinavia, they came up with these five subtypes of type 2 diabetes. And this is the first time, believe it or not, just five years ago, that subtypes of type 2 diabetes were described. The first one, called SAID or severe autoimmune diabetes, is actually not type 2 diabetes. GAD antibody is positive. So it's a variant of type 1 diabetes which occurs in older age group. So that you can straight away eliminate. So if you eliminate that, you have four subtypes of type 1, of type 2 diabetes. The first one is called as severe insulin deficient diabetes, which you can... Oh, this doesn't work. Okay. Uh, so severe insulin deficient variety where they are thin, they are young, and they don't have much insulin secretion. Okay, but they're not type 1 because they can respond to tablets. The second one is opposite of that. Obese people, insulin resistant, a lot of insulin in the body, but the insulin is not working. And that's insulin resistant diabetes. They had a third type called MOD, which really doesn't even exist in our population. It will come to that. Mild obesity related diabetes. That they described it, but we don't see it in India. Okay. And then the last one is simple, like my grandmother got it very late, getting it after 70, 80 years of age is MARD, mild age-related diabetes. It's usually mild and it comes at a later age group. So you've got these four types, severe insulin deficient one, severe insulin resistant one, then you've got a mild obesity one, and then the MARD one. The moment this is published 2018, all over the world, there's a lot of excitement. Hey, let's see what our type is like. Not because it's Me Too research, Oh, they did it, so we have to do it. Not because of that, but the question why it should be applied, can it be applied to Indians, is a logical one. Because for years before this came, we have been saying that our type 2 diabetes is different. It's very different. Why is it different? And I think Dr. Rajiv Raman mentioned this Asian Indian phenotype briefly this morning. If you look at type 2 diabetes in Indians, it occurs at least 20 years earlier than in the West. This has been known for the last 30 years. When a, if you take the mean age of type 2 diabetes in India, it is at least 20 years earlier than it occurs in the West. We don't know why, but it, that's what it is. The second is, you don't need gross obesity. If you take the typical American 
with type 2 diabetes, they're grossly obese. And it's that obesity which is driving the type 2 diabetes. If you walk around in my clinic, you won't find that many obese people. You'll find at a much lower BMI, we seem to be getting the diabetes. Insulin resistance and higher insulin levels in Indians compared to Europeans, a very early study of mine, the first study which is quoted there, the Diabetology paper, 1986. While working in the UK, I looked at the insulin levels in the Indians and the Europeans, and I found our levels are higher. That means we have to secrete more insulin to even to maintain normal glucose levels, some kind of insulin resistance we're having. More recently, in collaboration with Dr. Venkat Narayan's group in Emory, and Anurag is now very much part of that collaboration and CARS study, we found that we are losing beta cell function very fast. So we convert from pre-diabetes to diabetes much faster than the white European population. This has been confirmed in the UK as well. We have, in our own follow-up studies uh, in the CARS, we followed up for 15 years. The CURE study all show the same thing. So we seem to be losing beta cell function very rapidly, and I'll come back to that. Number five, I think, is one of the most important because we have a characteristic dyslipidemia. You know, uh, LDL cholesterol, you, the cholesterol is divided into LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, VLDL cholesterol, remnant cholesterol, and so on. This HDL cholesterol, I'm sure you all know, is a good cholesterol. So it actually protects you against atherosclerosis. Did you know, however, that we as Indians and South Asians, and include South Asians, we have Indian, Pakistanis, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Nepal. So only these countries seem to have a particular profile. If you go to China, it's different. If you go to Korea, it's different. If you go to Japan, it's different. But South Asians have this peculiar thing where we have the lowest HDL cholesterol in the whole world. This is very well known. For many, many years, we knew it when it was working in the UK also. In fact, we just take HDL, like I was talking about the microbiome. You look at the microbiome, you can separate out the Indians and the Danes, I told you in the morning. If you look at the HDL cholesterol, you can reasonably say, oh, this is an Indian HDL and that's a white. The white man very rarely has a low HDL. And we very rarely have a high HDL. Unless you have some genetic variant, you will not have. You measure all your HDLs, it'll be low. That's an Indian trait. Is it because of the rice we eat? Is it because of lesser physical activity? Is it because genetic, our SNPs are different? I don't know. We've been working for a very long time. Part answers only we have, but it's sure that we have a low HDL cholesterol. Why I'm stressing on this is because we use this in the model when we try to uh, replicate the Scandinavian model. There are many others. I'm not going to go into it. We have low, very low vitamin D, low muscle mass, low adiponectin, high inflammation, which we already talked about, two speakers before me talked about, and the gut microbiota are also different, as I mentioned in the morning. So with this kind of an Asian Indian phenotype, when we are getting the disease 20 years earlier, will we have the same thing as what Leaf Group and others describe? So this is a collaborative study with the University of Dundee. It's called INSPIRED, and INSPIRED stands for India-Scotland Partnership for Precision Medicine and Diabetes. And as part of this, uh, we published this paper, which uh, Rajiv uh, Raman showed you earlier, where we looked at the uh, subtypes of type 2 diabetes. What we did first was that we used the same clinical variables that Scandinavia used. And then we tried to look at it in a population, it's there in the paper. We got things all over the place. It just wasn't fitting in. What they got fit in very nicely with the Scandinavian population, it just wouldn't fit in with our population. After several iterations, we gave up. And we said, let's develop our own we brought in HDL into the model because they had not used lipids. We said HDL seems to be the most characteristic thing. Let's put that in triglyceride. The moment we put it, everything settled. And we got clear-cut uh, clear uh, subtypes, which I'll talk about. Where did the data come from? We have centers all over the country. So we initially, from our electronic database, we selected uh, much more than the numbers they had there, about 8,000, we had close to 20,000 people. Newly diagnosed diabetes, type 2, we included all of them. And then we used the following. Initially, we used the very same uh, clinical and biochemical variables that they used. But then subsequently, it was when we used the HDL and the triglycerides, the rest of them are the same. Uh, age of diagnosis, BMI, waist, HB1C, they had. Now, HOMA beta and HOMA IR, we had. We have used that also partly in the paper. 
But then what we use clinically is C-peptide. C-peptide is a very much simpler uh, assay to do. It's a very nice marker of insulin secretion. And we do it routinely in our patients, almost in everyone. So we had the data. So we said, let's apply that and see. Now we got four types of diabetes. The first and the last are very similar to what Scandinavia people had described. The severe insulin deficient one and the mild age-related one. But there were differences. Their mild age-related diabetes, MARD, occurred above 65 years of age. Ours occurred at 50 years of age. There, all the four groups are above 50 years of age. Only our MARD was above 50, all others in the 40s. Because we have shifted, the whole thing is shifted to the left, and we get type 2 diabetes at a much, much younger age group. So the MARD itself is different. The SID was actually very different because we were getting at a much younger age group and much more severe insulin deficiency. And this is what our collaboration with Dr. Venkat Narayan uh, and colleagues from Emory has been showing that we're losing beta cell function very fast and we probably have very low beta cell function compared to other ethnic groups. We had an insulin resistant obese diabetic group, IROD. We kept it as separate from the insulin resistant one described in Scandinavia because it was completely different. The clinical profile was completely different. So we had two, uh, two new types of type 2 diabetes that we described in our population. One is IROD, the insulin resistant one. And most interesting of all was the CIRDD variety. This is a combined insulin deficiency and insulin resistance variety. It didn't even exist in Scandinavia. And we found that. It was unique to our population, although only 12.1% of our population had it, it was unique to our population. And kindly note that they had the lowest HDL cholesterol and the highest triglycerides. So they were the most typical South Asian one, as I'll show you here. Just look at the HDL cholesterol in this particular slide. All the HDLs are low. You can see the HDL is 40, 38, 36 in the CARDD and 42. In the Caucasian population, it'll be 60 and above. 60, 65, 70 will be the HDL. For us, everybody has low, but the lowest is in the CARDD. Even more striking when you look at the triglycerides. The mean triglyceride is 149, 155, 351 in the CARDD, double that of the other groups. So they really have a severe dyslipidemia, okay? And then the other group is 136, the mild age-related one. Now, you don't have to go through all this, but just to tell you that the groups were definite because the insulin, the severe insulin deficient one, look at the C-peptide, lowest, the IROD variety, highest C-peptide. So the groups fitted in very nicely. We repeated it in another 20,000 people. We got very similar results. And then we are sure that it was fine. Now, the next question that they'll say is, you have selected people from your private clinics. Socioeconomically, they'll be very different from the rest of India, okay? So how can you say that this is an Indian cluster? It may be just your clinic's cluster. Point very well taken, and we knew that. And therefore, in the same study, we went back to our Indiab sample. The Indiab, actually, uh, Dr. Rajiv, Raman talked about the study. The study has just been, the full study has just been completed. The whole uh, of India, state by state, urban, rural, representative sample of every state in the country, just been completed and published last month in Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology. And that's where this number of 101 million people came. So from that study, we took the newly diagnosed people. Now, this is a truly representative Indian sample. And what we also did was, we eliminated the C-peptide because C-peptide may not be available in every clinic. We do it, but other clinics may not do it. So we said, let's first use it and then not use it and then see what happens. So we made it very simple. Age, every clinic will have. BMI is just height and weight. You can get that waist to simple waist measurement. HB1C, triglycerides, and HDL will be available in every clinic which treats diabetes. So these are the simplest that you can do. The good news was we got the exact four clustering same SID, same IROD, same CRDD, same MARD. Numbers are smaller because they're an epidemiological sample of uh, diabetics drawn from all over the country. But look at the HDL cholesterol and the triglycerides of the third variety. 31, if anything, even lower. When you go to the rest of the country and take the Indian sample, 31 is the mean 
HDL, and all done in the same lab, by the way. All the samples from India came to our central lab at uh, MDRF in Chennai. Look at the triglycerides of the third variety. 414 compared to 180, 180, and 150 in the other group, more than double. So it is very clear that this is, these are four distinct groups of subtypes of type 2 diabetes that we are seeing. Now, I'm happy to say that subsequently, the study was repeated in the UK, in South Asians there. This time, there are no Indians there, the Pakistanis and Bangladeshis, and they reported in PLOS Medicine last year that the combined CIRDD variety, which is described from Chennai, from India, has been now replicated in South Asians. So South Asians in general seem to have a typical phenotype. I've seen that in the UK coming back to India. There's very little difference between South Asian study. After all, there's an artificial line, line dividing India and Pakistan. You can't expect them to be totally different from what we are. So genetically and phenotypically, we seem to be very similar. And they've, they've specifically say we're able to reproduce the previously described diabetes subgroups. And the subsequent study from uh, other places have also shown that uh, uh, these four subtypes are uh, consistent. Now you may say, why do all this? Why don't you just give metformin to everybody? Ask them to walk, do some exercise, and cut down on their rice or something, and treat them all in the same way. Well, that's not precision diabetes. That's like a lottery, taking a lottery to treat. Also, there are differences with respect to complications, which is what Dr. Rajiv Raman was interested in. Now, the Scandinavian study showed that the SID variety, the thin insulin deficient variety is more prone to retinopathy, whereas the obese group was more prone to fatty liver and to kidney disease and heart disease. Not very surprising. What did we find? We found similar things. So if you look at the SID variety, retinopathy was much more, okay? And so, uh, not very surprisingly, the combined variety was also more prone to retinopathy. Why? Because they have insulin deficiency, severe insulin deficiency. Look at kidney disease more common in the insulin resistant variety. So our findings are similar to what Scandinavia showed. But again, we have this new variety, CARDD. They are also prone, more prone to kidney disease. So now, what are the peculiar features of the CARDD? First of all, they are very peculiar to South Asians. Number two, they have combined defect. Number three, they have the lowest HDL. Number four, they have the highest triglyceride. And number five, they are more prone to both kidney and eye complications. So they are a very, very special group to do uh, advanced studies on. Now, if you look at treatment, we all know as clinicians, if you start treating somebody as one group who will very easily get under control and the others who don't get under control. And just five years ago, before this clustering came, we wondered, we said, maybe it's karma, maybe it's this, uh, you know, some Urma Janma thing uh, that he had. That's why he responded. Now we know that these groups respond differently. If you give them treatment, of course, it's a retrospective thing. We didn't know what group they had. And so when you treated them, you can see the ones who got easily under uh, control is the green line on top. That's the MARD variety. They're the mildest diabetes, and they got easily under control. When, when talking about control, talking about HPNC less than 7%, okay? Which is the one which was most difficult to control? It was the SID variety, and they had the it was most difficult to control them. Which is the line which is almost hugging the, uh, the blue one? It is the third variety because they also have insulin deficiency. So when somebody has insulin deficiency, you go treat them with metformin, they're not going to respond. And so we found this out after we did the clustering, why some people are responding and others are not responding. So it does have clinical relevance to upfront know which type of diabetes you're treating, but then you can start treating in a different way. How do you do this now? You can't teach K clustering to everybody. I can't send everybody here for a training in artificial intelligence. I can't do all that to all the clinicians. So what we did was we developed a program. We developed a software program. It's called Diana. On the Diana tool, all you have to do is put in these basic facts, age, HP, and CBMI. And the tool will then automatically tell you which type of diabetes that you have. And it'll also tell you your risk of developing retinopathy or nephropathy. For example, this particular patient that we have put in, it tells you that this patient has severe insulin deficient diabetes, the five-year risk of developing retinopathy is 
56% uh, chance of developing kidney disease. It also suggests that you can either use insulin or sulfonylurea or a DPP-4 inhibitor as the first line drug, not metformin. Because here you've got insulin deficiency, you treat the insulin deficiency, okay? Now this is what the program is telling you after a lot of the data has been fed into it and the computer is now able to tell you this particular drug is probably better for you to start treatment. Obviously, more studies are needed and they are going on. Now we're doing genomic studies and some of them under publication. But then you also need an RCT to prove it. How do you know that if you treat the SID variety with a DPP-4 or a low-dose sulfonate that they'll do better? You don't know that. It's more theoretical. The computer is telling you that. But you have not proved it. So for that, you do an RCT. So we started an RCT. The RCT is called as aggregate study. And in the aggregate study, what we've done is we have used the Diana software to straight away pick up newly diagnosed people with type 2 diabetes, and then it'll tell us which type they belong to. If they have SID, one group is treated along the pathophysiological model that we expect based on this clustering. The other group we treat as usual, and that becomes a control group, okay? And for each of those groups, we have this now. We have a severe insulin deficiency, resistant variety in the combined. The MARD, we really didn't bother about. It's very easy to treat. We didn't bother about them. But in the younger age groups, when you get this, so we have this control arm and intervention arm. I'm happy to tell you that the study is progressing very well. And hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have the first study ever, which has looked at the pathophysiology and then prospectively treated it based on the pathophysiology. And we'll be able to tell you the results, whether it really worked or not. So far, it looks to be good. Let me now switch tracks and talk to you about something else. I'll talk to you about, so far what I talked to you is about type 2 diabetes. But if you take youth in India, it's much more complex. That's where you get all these different types. Above the age of 30 or 40, it's 95%, 98% is type 2. Very rarely you'll pick up a, that SAID variety, which we call as LADA latent autoimmune diabetes of adults. So you'll know that. They don't respond. They develop ketosis. Then you say, oh, gosh, this is not type 2 diabetes. Then you can treat that. But in the youth, if you have a 15-year-old or 12-year-old boy or girl coming to you, it can be a challenge to find out which type of diabetes. Because there are so many types. Type 1 is there. Early onset type 2 is there. Maturity onset diabetes of the young or MODI, which is a monogenic form of diabetes there. Fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes is there, where if you just take an X-ray, you'll find big stones in the pancreas. But how do you suspect that? Do you take X-ray for everyone? Okay, so you have to have algorithms by which you can sort these out. Then you have neonatal diabetes. Neonatal diabetes is on the day of birth. When you're born, you can have that. In the first six months, usually it's neonatal diabetes. Neonatal diabetes doesn't need insulin. You can treat them with tablets. So if you think it's type 1 diabetes, you'll end up treating them with insulin. So it's very important to get a handle on that. Apart from that, you have these genetic syndromes, which I mentioned, Volcott and there's gestational diabetes, which some of you are working on, and so on. We have a registry, the ICMR Young Diabetic Registry, which is uh, the, the coordinating center, national coordinating center is, uh, at Ames, Dr. Nikhil Tandon. But we work very uh, closely, and in the phase three of this cohort, for example, there's only Delhi and Ames. Uh, there's only Ames and uh, Chennai, MDRF. Uh, whereas in the first two phases, we had different, different centers from all over the country, but they've, they're not able to contribute enough cases. So finally, in phase three, uh, we have only Delhi and uh, Chennai as part of this. Now, as part of this, we have perhaps the, one of the largest registries of young diabetes in the world. And if you look at it, if you take people who are below 25 years of age in this registry, only 65% are type 1. So it doesn't mean that everyone who's young as type 1 diabetes. <clears throat> Almost a quarter of these patients all over the country have type 2 diabetes. And then you can have also Modi and GDM and others. Here is an earlier paper which we published from, from our center where we looked at the profile of diabetes in the young. And you can see it's actually transitioning. So in 1992 to 95, majority of patients even seen at our center had type 1 diabetes. The red is type 2. You can see gradually over the years, Type 2 is increasing. Type 1 is a little lower if you take the percentage, out of 100. So it's type 2 which is increasing. And I predict in the next 5 to 10 years, there's going to be an explosion of young children with type 2 diabetes. Type 1 is there, but it's kind of steady. 
How do you distinguish it by simple criteria? The younger you are, you're below 10 years. I showed you four cases of type two, but all the rest have type one. So at younger age group, the green shows you it's all type one. And then after 20, 25 years, type one is going down. You can see type two taking off after 15, 20 years of age. So if you have somebody who's 20, 25 years of age, more likely to be type two. For somebody who's six, eight years of age, more likely to be type one. So you've got one clue from the age itself. Below six months of age, most likely is neonatal diabetes. It's not type one. Okay. <clears throat> Why it is important is the younger you get diabetes, and this is only in type two, uh, below 20 years of age. This is very worrisome. You know, and Dr. Rajiv Raman will be very interested in this. These are all children who have got, children or adolescents who have got diabetes below 20 years of age. Okay. Look at retinopathy, kidney disease, neuropathy. And one is five years, five to 10 years, 15, and the, the pink is above 15 years duration. Now, if you add 15 years to somebody who's got below 20 years, their age is only 35. And by age 35, 81% have retinopathy. And about 30%, 34% have kidney disease at the age of 35. This is very worrying. This is very worrying because number one, they haven't done well. And number two, it's increasing. Number three, is there any way where we can find out who these 30% are who are going to develop kidney disease so that we can treat them more aggressively? We don't know the answers. You should help us to get those answers. Now let me switch again. If it is only type 1 and type 2 at young age, then it's easy. But then we have other types of diabetes. And for example, you have monogenic forms of diabetes. Now, monogenic forms of diabetes, nobody even thinks about them. And if they don't have obesity, they think, oh, this is not type 2, it must be type 1. And they unnecessarily treat them with four times insulin when they didn't need insulin at all in the first place. They could have been controlled with tablets. That is why you need to pick out those cases, send them for genetic testing, because without genetic testing, you cannot diagnose them. So how to select these patients for genetic testing? When you have a large number of uh, children in the clinic, how do you pick out this guy goes for genetic testing. This girl goes for genetic testing. How do you do that? So first thing we did was <clears throat> we took a large number of youngsters, screened them all, did genetic testing, found out those who had MODI or maturity onset diabetes of the young, published that recently, and then looked at, this is, I'm not going to go into that, how we went through the, the full set and then came down to those below 30 years and then for, screened further. And then we did the genetic testing. And then even within the MODI, there are some forms of MODI which respond to tablets. If you pick those ones, it's enough. The MODI you don't respond to insulin doesn't matter whether it's MODI or type 1 diabetes. So these we called as the actionable MODI. After doing that, we looked at the clinical profile in great detail and we were able to say which was the thinnest, which was the most obese among the MODI, which was the youngest which is the oldest. We had to literally go through every one of that MODI because there's no such data in India. And from there, we went to the next paper just published in scientific reports last week, where we said, using which biochemical parameter in a clinic can you say who to send for genetic testing? So this is the clinical details. For example, the C-peptide was the most useful and I'll come to that in a minute. But then these were the distribution of the graphs. So if you look at the age at onset, we had three groups here. We had type 1, we had type 2, and we had MODI. And we said, by age at onset, can you distinguish them? Type 1 and MODI are overlapping, so you can't. Can you do it by BMI? They're coming somewhere in the middle, but there's a big overlap. Can you do it by HbA1c? Not at all. They're, they're overlapping. Can you do it by HDL cholesterol? Partly, but not fully. But when you came to C-peptide, you can see that if you do a stimulated C-peptide, what do you do with stimulated C-peptide? We just give them breakfast and do the C-peptide again. Very simple test, which we do anyway routinely in the clinic. It beautifully separated out the MODI from the type 1s. And the, the first graph that you see here is the type 1, and that is type 2, and in the middle is the MODI. So it looked as if from this particular analysis that... Um, the stimulated C-peptide had the best sensitivity, almost 96.8, to pick up MODI in a clinic. And there are certain 
C peptide at which you can completely eliminate. We call it as rule in and rule out. So you can completely rule out that this person will not have type 1 diabetes. This person will not have type 2 diabetes. It goes below a particular point. So using that, now we have been able to pick up whom should be screened for Modi in India. I think this will be a valuable contribution. So <clears throat> based on all this now, we have developed an algorithm as to when a young patient comes in India, how do you diagnose them? Very simple algorithms we have developed, which are the kind of things we'd like to work with you guys. Is there a family history of diabetes? When they first come, we don't send them a genetic test. We take a pencil and a paper and draw the family history. If there is no family history, almost you've eliminated type 2 and Modi, and it's likely to be type 1, okay? If there is a family history, you see, does it go through three generations or more? If it goes through three generations, it's likely to be Modi. You look at the C-peptide, it's in between type 1 and type 2. Then you do the genetic testing, you can find out the Modi. When you do the genetic testing, it'll also tell you which type of Modi you have, whether it's an actionable Modi or not an actionable Modi. Now, if it doesn't go through three generation transmission and there is obesity, it's likely to be early onset type 2 diabetes. If there is no family history of diabetes, look for ketones, very simple urinary ketones or blood ketones. If it is present, C peptide will be absent. There's no insulin secretion. It's type 1 diabetes. You do the antibody testing, it can be antibody positive type 1 or an antibody idiopathic or an antibody negative type 1. Now, if the C peptide is not absent, but some part of it is present, there's no ketones. That is a case we'll have the fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes. So you do an abdominal x-ray, you'll find the big stones there. You know it's fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes. Why should you know fibrocalcific pancreatic? Because you treat the exocrine pancreas as well. You have to give them pancreatic enzymes. And also, about 20% of them, unfortunately, will develop pancreatic cancer in the next 20 years. So you have to know. And you can't just leave it off without taking the x-ray. And finally, if you leave all that out, you still have your genetic syndromes and you got your endocrine diabetes. Looks very simple. It took us about 40, 50 years to get to this, studying hundreds of thousands of patients. But from here, I think now, we had no AI, we had nothing when we started this. But I think now, using AI and so on, we can come to better refinement of these techniques. And this is typically precision diabetes at its best. So to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time in India we've done clustering, which shows uh, four different uh, clusters of type 2 diabetes, two of which are the same as Scandinavia, the SID and the MARD, the IROD and the CARDD. Particularly the CARDD is of great importance because uh, it is characterized by very difficult to control hyperglycemia and retinopathy, nephropathy, uh, all the, these guys are prone to. To distinguish MODI from other types of diabetes, we find in a biochemical panel a stimulated C-peptide is the best. The aggregate study will tell us whether this division into these four types and treating with the pathophysiology, it's the first study in the world I know of, which is doing this. There may be others which are also working on similar lines. But when the end of this year, when we finish the study, it'll tell us how to treat diabetes. So probably the guidelines for treating type 2 diabetes will be rewritten after the aggregate study is over. Remember that all children who present to a clinic need not have type 1 diabetes. And this is something in social media I'm continuously telling people, is your child diagnosed as type 1? Come and meet us. At least we'll tell you whether it's worth doing a genetic test. Maybe 5% of them or 10% of them may not have type 1 diabetes. We can take your child off insulin and treat your child with tablets, which is a complete life-changing uh, situation for the child. And uh, using these clinical algorithms, it's possible to not only find out who has Modi, but also type 1, type 2, FCPD, and all the other types. So these are our first steps towards uh, precision diabetes. And I hope that uh, my coming here will lead to some kind of collaboration. I'm already collaborating with the two earlier speakers. And hopefully, our collaborations will extend to many of you youngsters sitting in the audience. Thank you. Any questions? I'll be happy. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Very, very exciting talk. And I have three questions. Actually, I'll try to keep it brief. So the first is more physiological. In the group that you were showing bar plots less than 15 years and less than five years, 
complications that develop in more than 15 years. So I noticed that there's some complications like, like microalbuminuria, where you had more or less a linear trend going up. Others like uh, neurological complications had an exponential. Do you have a physiological basis or a clinical basis? For yes, <clears throat> because microalbuminuria is reversible. So at the time of uncontrolled diabetes at onset, you can have microalbuminuria, which after you treat, it can become normal. You need persistent microalbuminuria to call that. The next stage, the kidney disease nephropathy, which I showed you, is when it's gone beyond microalbuminuria to macroalbuminuria, when there is heavy proteinuria, that is less reversible, and that's where you find a linear trend. Neuropathy, on the other hand, the nerves have to get damaged, and therefore it, it uh, takes longer. And retinopathy, of course, is the best parameter because you can actually see the lesions and document it. When you have neuropathy, and I was uh, impressed with uh, Dr. Rajiv Raman's work trying to look at neuropathy uh, from retinopathy, it's difficult, Rajiv, and the reason is that neuropathy, retinopathy, you know, like we talked about hypertensive retinopathy and diabetic retinopathy, you see the lesions. Neuropathy, all you're saying is lack of sensation. How do you know it's due to diabetes? There's no specific marker. Anything can produce neuropathy. Leprosy can produce, or any other drugs can produce. Lead can produce. So many other things can produce neuropathy. And that's why the correlation with neuropathy is not that good. But in our study, which we published together, the kidney disease came out better because there you have the markers are little better, cystatin and microalgae. Thank you. And that brings to my next question. So, which also then basically means that in these clusters, the interventions that we are doing are very tightly ingrained into the clusters that we are building. Yep. So do you see a challenge there that when we are actually, when interventions are a part of the clustering process, they are, they are inherent in this. Um, and our optimization of outcomes is towards treatment response as well. Do you see um, uh, a loop there that uh, is difficult to resolve uh, under this kind of setup? So, so the, the data which I showed was. you earlier, the retrospective data, the time taken to control to reach A1C, that is a retrospective. We didn't know about the clustering. We went back and did the clustering and found who was easy to treat, who was not easy to treat. And we found those differences, which fitted in with the physiological thing. The aggregate study being a RCT, since we have a control arm where we're treating in the usual way, we're not telling them that they even have which type of diet. You just treat in the usual way. The other group is told that this is SID. You have to treat this way. This is the drugs which you're going to use. And the, all the drugs use are generic drugs. So there's no question of cost coming in there. So at the end of the trial, we will know whether theoretically the group which is treated in the pathophysiological way should do better. But until you prove it, you really don't know. And RCT can only prove that. So Absolutely. we'll wait till the study is published. Absolutely. And, and my last question is um, about the clustering process itself. So, um, I mean, that's a generic question in clustering field that how do you know? Because as you said, your grandmother developed it quite late, MARD type, but then it was severe. So I'm assuming that even within these types, there are there's a spectrum as yep. well. So looks nice to have these clinical, but do you think that there's a, how do you choose the cut points and how yep. many? So... They, they were again developed as part of the algorithm, but there are, you're, you're right, there are. there is one group, Andrew Hattersley's uh, group, John Dennis, he published a paper saying you don't need to do clustering and don't need to bucket them into four groups. You treat the individual. Individual who's coming, is it obese, non-obese, this, that, use that, and he feels that is a more physiological way of treating, and you're now going down to the individual, not trying to cluster not everybody in a cluster will develop. There'll be heterogeneity within the cluster. When you do the aggregate study, we'll probably find some responders, some non-responders. Now that will bring us to the next question. Why is there? Because genetically, they could be different. This is based on phenotype. So genetically, they, some may have TCF7L2, some will have something else, FTO gene. So they may respond differently. So we'll have to, but we have genetic samples on all of them. So hopefully we'll get more answers. The problem is the more answers you get that lead to more questions. Thank you so much. Thanks. Anyone else? Yes, at the back, sir. Great, great talk, sir. So a couple of questions. So you mentioned the incidence of T2D uh, type 2 diabetes is increasing in youth, right? Uh, could you say why that's happening? Obvious answer is obesity. Because uh, obesity in children, both boys and girls, astronomically it's increasing and is that related to diet you think changes yes. in diet uh, junk foods then uh, lack of physical activity too much of screen time stress 
because of the pressure of curriculum and poor curriculum activities and so on, basically lack of physical activity and junk foods and excess calories. So obesity all over the world is increasing. In India, it's just rising and rising. And if you have the genes, if both your parents are diabetic and if you have diabetes and you have the gene uh, for it, and then you develop insulin resistance with obesity, it'll come. Uh, for girls, it'll start with irregular periods and PCOS as being the first starting stage. For boys, it'll just start with insulin resistance, obesity, acanthosis, nigric. And so look at the neck, you'll find a, a kind of brown, velvety thing. That's a clear sign that you have insulin resistance. These are the people who will develop type 2 diabetes. Thanks. And, and the second is related is, so you spoke about how the different clusters respond differently to different drugs. But have you noticed differences in response to just, you know, lifestyle interventions? Like even between individuals, perhaps there are two individuals with the same, you know, they, they put in the same amount of effort going, you know, trying resistance training or a low carb diet. But are there differences even in response to lifestyle? Definitely, changes? because if you have the IROD variety, the insulin resistant obese diabetic, you have the best chances of achieving remission because you can lose 5, 10, 15 kilograms in weight. The SID guy is already thin. So what weight is he going to lose? What calories is he going to cut? So therefore, and he has already insulin deficiency. So he's starting off on a very bad, unless, and he might need insulin much faster. So the, the response to lifestyle itself will depend on your starting BMI and other risk factors. So if you have obesity, it's actually an advantage for you to lose weight. And they are the people who can go into remission. Whereas a thin SID person going to remission is very unlikely. So just like one, one third was like for the monogenic cases, are there specific genes you screen for or? Yeah. So we have a panel of uh, 78 genes, which screens for 14 different types of Modi and about six to eight types of uh, neonatal diabetes. The genetic syndromes are about 20, 25 or so. Then added to that is another condition called congenital hyperinsulinemia with hypoglycemia, the opposite of neonatal diabetes. It's actually the same genes, actually. One is a gain of function, and the other is a loss of function. The ABCC8 uh, gene and the KCNJ11. So they come with hypoglycemia. On the day of birth, the child is getting hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, then getting brain damage because of low sugars. So if you detect that, there are specific drugs to treat that type of... Earlier, these children used to be sent off a pancreatectomy. They remove the, you know, three or two-thirds of the pancreas to, to prevent the hypoglycemia. Today, we have avoided all that by, for example, from, uh, from, a, from Ames, Delhi itself, we had about 50 cases referred to us for genetic testing. We are able to find out those who respond to diazoxide, they have a particular gene mutation. Those who don't respond to diazoxide and respond to octreotide, they have a different gene mutation. We have described all that now. So if a child comes, by doing the genetic testing, not only we make the diagnosis, we are also able to say the treatment, which treatment is to be given. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, Rajiv. Uh, Anurag. Anurag, yeah, go ahead. So, so fascinating as always. I want to take a bit deeper into the insulin combined. Yeah. Insulin resistance and... CIRDD. Yeah. So when you were showing the C-peptide levels, one could make out the baseline levels were on the higher side. Higher than SID, but lower than IROD. Yeah. But very importantly, the stimulated levels were, yeah. again, the lowest after the... Yeah, deficiency. after SIDS, correct. Yeah. So these are people that I presume the beta cells are working, but overloaded. Yes. So have borderline insulin resistance, but can't keep up. Correct. Absolutely. Do they shift phenotype as they get older? So that is a question which uh, related to the earlier question also. You can actually shift your, uh, uh, not only when you get older, but after treatment. For example, if you treat them properly and their insulin level improves, they may, dif they may behave differently. If the IROD guy loses weight, his insulin level will come down. His insulin resistance will go. So he'll no, no longer be in IROD. So these clustering, is the, they are only useful at the time when they come to you first. After five years, 10 years down the line, it really, because some drugs increase weight. We know that pyoglutazone, sulfonylurea, insulin increases weight. We know that SGLT2s, GLP1s reduce weight. We put them on a drug, their profile is going to change. They are useful to you as a clinician, as they walk in through the door, oh, he's a thin guy, maybe Sid, okay? Another obese guy, oh, this must be IROD. 
they're old up and this must be mod. So straight away we're beginning to think and in our mind, we're already processing what drug to give him and what treatment to give the person. To that extent, it's useful. But only after the trial, we can say whether even that is right or wrong. For all you know, it may be a negative trial. Don't know. Sir, just... Ah, yes, Rajiv, could you sorry. could you did you look into the phenotype of retinopathy? Is it different among all the groups? We'll do yes. it with you. Hmm? <laughs> we'll do it with you. I said. <laughs> would love Let's to look, look at that because we have only retinopathy <clears throat> present absent only. We are not yeah. gone deep into see, because that. Because we do but see. Obviously, many... we should do that. We... Okay. So the you know the the adolescent uh, uh, people whom I said they get it at 12, 14 by 18 they lose vision. They have PDR. Proliferative retinopathy occurring in four years after something genetic about it. It can't be their A1C will be eight, nine. Not enough to produce PDR in four years time. So there's some genetic factor and there's a lot of work to be done in that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, sorry, I have two questions. Yeah, we're just getting to that. Yeah, so. First is uh, earlier, uh, previous week, we listened to a talk on gestational diabetes. Yes. And uh, the children Dr. of Saron the and mother. Yeah, so yeah, we are collaborating with him. What's your study, observation yeah. on that? Do those children of uh, mothers with gestational diabetes are more prone to diabetes? What was course, your observation? Of course. And in the STRIDE study, which uh, Saron and uh, presented, also we are following up those children. But if you take all GDMs, in India, in South Asia, we have the highest conversion to diabetes naturally because our insulin secretion is low and we are more susceptible. Within the first one year, 20% will develop either diabetes or pre-diabetes. By five to seven years time, 50 to 70% of them will develop type 2 diabetes. But what we recently reported in another series is that 30 of them out of a series of about 1,000 women with GDM whom we followed up, 30 of them developed type 1 diabetes. So we went back and said, how come these children developed, uh, these uh, women developed uh, type 1 diabetes and not, uh, not the children, the, the mothers, developed type 1 and not type 2. Then we found that during the GDM, when they were treated, those 30 people needed high doses of insulin several times a day. Of course, it went away. After the delivery, it went away for 6 months, 9 months, 1 year, they didn't have. But when it came back, they were GAD positive. So had we done the GAD testing when they were pregnant, we could have predicted and said, but we don't do GAD for all pregnant women. So we didn't think of it. For GDM, we normally don't do GAD. It's not part of our protocol. So now we're thinking maybe every pregnant woman. And some of those pregnant women who come with diabetes actually have MODI. There's an entity called MODI2, which is GCK MODI, where they don't need treatment at all. But during pregnancy, the sugars will go up. And at that time, they need either tablets or, or insulin. Uh, so... Yes, they do develop diabetes, and it gives us a unique opportunity to prevent diabetes in them. So if you are able to, and that is a part of the study called Living Study, which Nikhil Tandon uh, and we all did together, where we looked at these women, took them, advised them exercise and diet and so on, and tried to prevent it. Unfortunately, COVID hit, and those two years when doing the study, we couldn't get proper you know, uh, contact with the women and so on. So it, didn't, it turned out to be a negative study. But... Yes, definitely they are the group whom we should concentrate on because their children are also prone, as Dr. Yajnik showed in Pune through his Pune maternal studies, that the children can also get diabetes. So it's a two generational thing. And the second question is, we see uh, many advertisements these days saying there is reversal of diabetes and we don't have diabetes anymore. So is that true? Like It's partly true. So I said, like I said, the IROD variety. So a, B, C, D, E. If you remember, you'll know who will reverse. A, A1C. Your A1C is not very high. Okay, Below 6.5 is reversal without medicine. If it is 8, 8.5, you can reverse. If it is 12, very unlikely, you'll most probably be in the SID variety. You can't. B, body weight. So either body weight or BMI. If it is high, you have a chance of reversal. C, C-peptide. If your C-peptide is good, then you're not in the SID variety, you're in the IROD variety, you're more likely to reverse. D, duration of diabetes. Your duration of diabetes is short. Five years up to eight years, you can get reversal. If it's 10, 12, 15 years, as uh, uh, Anurag just said, then your profile will change. 
and then reversal becomes very difficult. And E stands for an enthusiastic individual, motivated person. So if you have A, B, C, D, or E, you are the people who can try for reversal. What the reversal people keep saying is to everyone we can reverse. Even if you have kidney disease, come to us, we'll reverse. That's all not true. Absolutely not. Okay. Thank you. We are out of time, so let's thank Dr. Mohan. And so we have a